I'm Nigel Voisey. I designed the VB36 lathe. Today we've come to Northwich to Tracy Owen's workshop. Tracy works uh, all day, every day virtually, producing uh, bowls and hollow vessels. Tracy, why did you choose the VB36? I know you've worked with a lot of different machines in your time as a turner. I wanted a nice, big, stable, robust machine. Right. Particularly the bearings, I know, were a matter of concern to you. Well, that was the main attraction, um, having that vibration problem on other machines. I wanted something that was stable, and this is the machine I chose. Right. I see you, you do some uh, um, ornamental work, some, I suppose you'd call them speculative uh, pieces, but I know that your main um, uh, time is taken, really, in production turning. This is a typical salad bowl that you make. Um, uh, this would finish, I suppose, at about 18 inches, 17, 18 inches, and it's, um, it's wet, very wet at the moment. Uh, how long did it take you, as a matter of interest, to, to rough that down and to hollow it out? I know you, you use the McNaughton Centre Saver um, system. Uh, what would the complete process take in terms of time? I'll try to do that part as quickly as possible. I don't want to take that um, any more time than it needs to, so um, to cut that and put it on a face plate and to cone out the middle, that whole process, probably about um, 20 minutes or so. Right. So, and you make uh, smaller bowls, obviously, from the centres. This is, a, again, a, a typical... Uh, that's a 12 inch, that one. 12 inch, right. And uh, then you, you dry them, obviously. How long would it take to dry these? Um, they're, they're air dried normally for three to six months. Right, three to six months. How many of these do you turn out in a year? Um, so about a thousand functional salad bowls. Right, and each one is mounted twice. Yeah, they've been rough turned and then returned when they're dry. Right, yeah. And I know you also really enjoy this side of your returning. Uh, what we call speculative pieces, I suppose. The, um, this is a lovely uh, figure on this piece of view. About how tall do you make these uh, hollow vessels? I've got some of those about two foot tall. And diameter? Um, about 12 inch. Right. And that's constrained really by the availability of the timber rather than any... That's right, yes. Yeah. The, machine, the machine will cope with a lot bigger. I know, in fact, uh, we'll be seeing later on uh, one piece that was turned on this, which uh, actually was overhanging the main bearing without a tailstock uh, by uh, over three feet. Right. And uh, the piece weighed uh, originally about 600 weight. So um, that's the sort of work that you can put on it. And uh, I also see that you, you have this uh, beautiful Jara burr. Uh, what did that weigh when it started? It went on about 50 kilos. Right. They've had to comb the middle out to save the middle section and that with a Norton system. But it's still quite a heavy piece mm. when it's finished. So what makes the VB36 a good lathe? Uh, well, in terms of capacity, uh, over the beam, the tool rest beam, uh, you can mount a 36 inch diameter piece. Uh, some turners have actually turned um, pieces uh, to about three foot six in length, overhanging the main bearing. Uh, one piece was over 600 weight, in fact. Uh, with the restriction of the beam, that limits the diameter to 36 inches. But of course, the beam itself can be positioned clear of the turning circle, so that you can use the tool from behind the uh, the work if you say making a big uh, wall hanging uh, or a tabletop um, or in fact a bowl of course you can still work from behind with advantage uh, then you would need to relocate the tool rest in front of the work uh, a freestanding rest which we'll deal with a little bit later on the, uh, the lathe fitting is a bayonet type fitting three high tensile bolts uh, screw into the back of the chuck or face plate which is being used. That locates on the flange here, turns 15 degrees and the bolts are tightened. It means that there's total security for uh, extremely heavy loads. Uh, the, the taper here is a number three Morse taper because of course a tailstock can be fitted uh, so you can work between centers. Uh, we also make a range of adapters which locate on here 
uh, for any thread at all. So if you have an existing lathe, uh, Harrison, uh, Apollo, whatever it is, then we can supply uh, an adapter with that machine thread and the Morse taper on the, the original lathe fitting as well. This is a typical adap ad adapter. This is the adapter for the Harrison graduate uh, thread form and uh, Morse taper. When you're actually checking a lathe or examining it, um, check that the Morse taper has actually been ground. A lot of uh, lathes actually just have a turned taper. You can tell by the uh, grooves or ridges which are left by the tool. A ground taper obviously is a much more precise uh, arrangement uh, and process. Um, here are the high tensile bolts. They simply are inserted through the holes, turn 15 degrees, then they're tightened. There is an, ad an additional security feature. Uh, a grub screw can be uh, tightened through here, which totally prevents any possibility of the um, adapter or faceplate or chuck, whatever you're using, in fact, uh, from coming off. I've worked with a lot of lathes uh, over the years myself as a professional turner and uh, I found that tool rests uh, very often were designed by people who had never actually turned. Um, they were designed so that it was impossible to use an underhand grip, a palm up grip with a tool uh, running across the tops of the fingers, or the palm of the fingers. Um, uh, they um, uh, couldn't be brought close enough to the work to, uh, uh, to minimize tool overhang. And uh, very often they moved. They, uh, they simply weren't rigid assemblies. Uh, also, with many designs of lathe, it isn't possible, or hasn't been possible, to access the, the full area or the full sweep of the work um, in a properly balanced position. You very often find that uh, you have to lean over and uh, your arms are uh, away from your body, where your best control comes when you have your elbows tight into the body. So one of the design principles that I followed uh, was first of all to have a completely rigid uh, tool rest assembly that could be positioned anywhere around the work uh, so that uh, it was possible to turn in a comfortably balanced stance uh, without overreaching. So to meet this requirement in the case of the VB, we have a, a meter long beam. The beam actually uh, grips and locks by a parallel expanding motion. I'll show you the folding wedge mechanism in a moment. Uh, but this allows the tool rest to be positioned uh, virtually wherever you would want it to be and locked immovably. Um, in this case, I'll just move it around so you can see the, the full range of movement. Tool rest, of course, uh, is independently adjustable. If you're working at the front of a long piece, Tool rest can be brought out to that sort of position so you can get a full 24 inches projection. Anything longer than that, and you would require uh, the independent or freestanding rest. The beam is quite rigid enough to absorb all the cutting forces in normal turning work, uh, but if you aren't working at full extension or there's a, a lot of impact from the cutting force um, impacting the tool, then there's an additional support leg which uh, totally absorbs all the, the vertical forces. The, uh, the beam mechanism uh, actually provides a huge vertical clamping force. It operates on these uh, folding wedge principles. There are um, tapers, tapered blocks in the underside of the, the clamping strip and tapered blocks here on the, uh, the beam itself. These are slid along the beam by the operation of this hand wheel, driving a lead screw, which uh, causes the beam to either expand or contract in a parallel motion. You can see also that this uh, crank handle, which operates the expansion mechanism for the beam, uh, can be sighted in any position when it's not in use, and uh, the handle actually folds away also.
The Ribby comes with a standard 300 mm tool rust. Um, the tool rusts are made from a 40 mm diameter stem, steel stem, and a, a SG cast iron, which is spheroidal graphite. It has the same tensile strength as the, uh, the steel itself, uh, so that they are what we would class as unbreakable, so they'll absorb huge shock loads. Um, they have a profile which uh, allows the fingers of the turning hand to be positioned uh, underneath the tool, even when the tool is held at a very, a very steep angle of attack. Um, similarly, of course, they allow the fingers to be positioned very close to the cutting edge of the tool, uh, but in perfect safety. Another feature of these rests is the fact that they're tapped for a pin, a horizontal pin, some turning styles, such as those of uh, Melvin Firmiger, uh, require this pin and it allows the hand to have positive uh, location uh, with the, this part of the rest and the tool which is held in different ways for different techniques. You may have noticed that the external surface or diameter of this post is machined. Um, that wouldn't normally be necessary because the tool rests of course fit inside the, uh, the post. Uh, but on the VB we have a tool rest which actually encircles the post. It's uh, the extra long uh, deep hollowing rest which gives a 20 inch reach inside uh, deep vessels. We'll talk more about that later. But you can also see that there are various holes machined, threaded tapped holes um, so that uh, the accessories and components of that system can be um, fitted at any time. Lathe speed, of course, is very important for safe turning and enjoyable turning. Uh, the VB has a speed range from 50 up to a maximum speed of 2,600 RPM. Um, it's quite possible, uh, in fact, some manufacturers do set their speed ranges to run from zero. Uh, that doesn't have any practical value. The uh, motor should be running at a, a minimal speed um, in order to, uh, to preserve its own life. Um, but uh, it's also true that at very, very low speeds, uh, single figure speeds, you really don't uh, deliver any significant torque. Um, what we have done is to set the bottom speed at 50. And it's controlled. Uh, as I'll show you in a moment, on the speed control uh, system, which can be positioned anywhere on the machine, uh, any flat surface or, in fact, on a, a flat metal plate, wherever you'd like it to be. Various controls enable you to run it in forward, reverse, uh, alter the speed um, by turning the dial, uh, fast and slow acceleration ramps, so if you have very large or fragile work for that matter and you want to run it up uh, with extreme care uh, or in fact uh, switch it off and let it run down without any surges then this control enables you to do that. The three ratios, the three speed ratios are changed by means of a belt. Um, the uh, inspection cover opens the belt is tensioned or detensioned by means of this crank, uh, and the belt simply positioned on one of three alternative ratios. While we have the, the hatch open, you can see the transmission system. Uh, the main shaft is a 60 millimeter diameter, and the large diameter pulley for the low speed ratio is in fact uh, 240 millimeters in diameter. It's driven from a 60 millimeter diameter main drive pulley. The advantage of this, apart from the fact that it gives a 4 to 1 uh, drive reduction, which effectively increases the uh, power delivery by uh, 4, um, is that the large diameters enable maximum power to be transmitted. It's simple enough to devise a 4 to 1 reduction pulley system driven off a very small pulley uh, to reduce costs, but it won't transmit the power that's required. Here we have uh, two belts, so that there are 15 ribs in contact with the belts on the lowest ratio. Uh, one belt can be used, the wider of the two belts, a 10 rib belt. On the intermediate uh, pulley,